We've gone over a lot of information, inclusive of what the limbic system is and what is a limbic system retraining program. So now let's unpack more six key characteristics of a good limbic system retraining exercise. And sometimes there might be this assumption where you do the exercise and then that's it. So if a provider suggests, hey, you should try meditation and you go on your app and you hit a meditation and you complete it, a lot of folks assume that that will be contributing to their overall health. And I'm gonna say yes and no. Where yes, it is helpful that you're doing something, but that act alone can act like a Band-Aid where we're not getting to the root of the issue, which is why these six key characteristics are pretty vital when trying out a tool. The first step is always going to be awareness. I also like to use the three A's acronym for awareness, acceptance, and action. Really within anything, if we don't have awareness that we have a problem, we don't know how potentially where to pivot. And I re relate this a lot to my own recovery, where if I had not come into a state of awareness and acceptance that I had an addiction, I would not be able to actually heal. And there might be a lot of self-denying and not engaging in the proper practices if I did not have the awareness first. So identification is the number one bullet to start us out here as the person must become aware of the heightened stress, their heightened stress response, what their triggers are, how it feels in their body. And it's so much more than awareness that I have a problem. It's awareness of what it's doing to my entire system which may sound overwhelming at first, but a lot of this work is gonna be really slow because we don't wanna overwhelm the system and create more stress for you. So instead, it's taking a little bit at a time in your steps to become a more aware human, which is why one of the key elements of a limbic system program is to incorporate mindfulness. Mindfulness allows us to become more aware of the present moment without judgment of what's happening or having more acceptance of what's happening, which can then propel us to more action. So the second bullet point is interruption. And this comes more from the neuroscience idea of neuroplasticity, that in order to create change, I need to be doing something over and over and over again to interrupt the cycle. And although it has been suggested that it takes 21 days to create a habit, a lot more research is showing that it does take much longer to create a new neural pathway. So it's, it tends to be about 67 days, so give or take three to four months. And that time frame can feel really challenging for folks, as if we are experiencing suffering, we want to eliminate it from the get go. But with this work being very intentional, it does tend to lean more towards the slower side. So although you might not be experiencing maybe rapid relief, that's not to say that you won't experience some relief. It might not be the instantaneous release that we're used to though, because we live in a very instant gratification society. So keeping in mind the neuroscience of it all is highly encouraging as this gives us hope to stay the course. So not only are we looking at more of the neural pathways that are be, being created, we are also looking at the neurochemicals. Um, ultimately, 
a limbic system exercise is moving us from can, cortisol, adrenaline, norepinephrine to dose, dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and endorphins. And again, this can take time. It's not instantaneous, but these feel good chemicals are definitely uh, highly convincing for us to keep showing up once we start to feel those chemicals kick in. One of the missing pieces that I do often notice in limbic system retraining is a lot of their exercises tend to focus solely on the mind. And what we're missing a lot of is noticing the body. Some of the exercises that tend to be suggested like meditation and visualization can often get us stuck in this intellectualization piece of trying to outsmart our stress or rationalize our stress. And that definitely is a survival response. Um, so I'm not demonizing that in any way. It can be highly effective, but it can only do so much, which is where somatic experiencing comes in. <clears throat> it's not simply enough to to understand the process of what's happening in your brain, to actually have a complete emotional shift, it must be felt in your body. So trying to bear witness to some of the felt sensation of our experience when we do have stress or when we are noticing patterns, um, really trying to keep in mind what that feels like so that we can also reprocess it where it doesn't feel as maybe emotionally overwhelming for the body, where the brain's gonna be like, I need to shut this down instantaneously. Rather, we're trying to create uh, more space um, for us to work with maybe challenging sensations and the neuroceptive belief of where maybe the brain doesn't need to come in and instantaneously try to solve it, but what would it look like to sit with sensation a little longer and increase your capacity around what's happening in both body and in mind. The next bullet point of intrinsic reward I briefly mentioned um, on the last slide, but we as humans are definitely a rewards-based culture. Um, we can look back to very famous uh, psychological experiments like Pavlov's dog or um, B.F. Skinner and his experiment with rat seeking uh, reward to press a button and get more cheese. So we are definitely folks that um, like to feel good. And if it feels good, we continue generally to pursue it. So if we can continue this process of identifying, interrupting, and replacing maybe an unpleasant experience or response with a new positive one that will definitely kick in those uh, more positive chemicals. Um, and it also will feel good to the body, the felt sense of the body. And eventually this becomes its own reward that we're continuing to seek out these things that allow us to feel more safe, um, and able to show up in the world in a more full way. The last point is, um, and kind of mentioned it before in this conversation that we've been having, is repetition, repetition, repetition. Uh, Bruce Lee famously said, I don't fear the man who practiced 10,000 different kicks. I fear the man who practiced one kick 10,000 times. To put this into perspective, um, there is a study that we did a couple of years back where we were looking at different lengths of meditation, so different dosages of meditation. And what we found is that it didn't necessarily matter if you were doing a longer meditation practice, like once a month. So let's say 20 minutes once a month versus a minute practice every day the minute practice every day mattered more. So frequency matters more than one singular dosage less frequently. We want to continue to repeat because otherwise it's not going to land in the felt sense of the body, nor will it create a neural pathway if we're not doing it frequently. So there is incentive to showing up and practicing. Now that we've gone over six key characteristics, some very common 
limbic system retraining exercises are as follows, which definitely meet the six key characteristics. I often start um, with the first bullet point of deep breathing as it's a pretty instantaneous change of state for the body. And it tends to be more accessible for folks as we're giving them um, bumpers in their bowling alley. So we're giving them a little bit of comfort to work with. For deep breathing, my suggestion would be to emphasize the exhale more as that automatically kicks in our parasympathetic state of our rested and digest side of the central nervous system. The typical tool that I'll recommend is a four, six count breath of an inhale for four through the nose and an exhale through the nose or mouth for a count of six. If you are a mouth breather, no worries. Um, some folks are not able to breathe for the, through their nose, whether that be because of sinus challenges or how their the structure or, of their anatomy is. So I never want to discredit that. Uh, but if you can, maybe try out the inhaling and exhaling through the nose first and see what shows up and then change accordingly. Meditation is a very common limbic system retraining exercise as well, as it allows our focus muscles to increase. It also creates awareness, back to that first bullet point that was mentioned. Meditation often is misinterpreted where many folks assume that they might need to turn off their mind, rather that's it's the exact opposite of bearing witness to our thoughts with more compassion. So when we meditate, we're bearing witness to our stories of the thoughts that consistently show up. This gives us greater awareness of where we can pivot. Visualization is pretty similar where we are noticing, but it can be used for different means to an end. So on one side, visualization can be a relaxation guidance, something like yoga nidra, where it is allowing us to feel a deeper sense of relaxation. On the other hand, visualization can also be used for um, more reprogramming and reprocessing. So something like a hypnosis where we are noticing the issue and also feeling it because it does feel very real the body's feeling it, the mind is processing through it. Visualization is very helpful um, in order to really take root of the problem. The last three are very much body-based limbic system retraining exercises. Yoga is something that I also recommend for many of my clients as it's pretty diverse in its offerings, whether you're doing a vinyasa or, or a flow maybe a power yoga class where it engages the sympathetic. Maybe you're doing yin or restorative, which tends to lean more towards the parasympathetic. In all of these practices, we're also witnessing our thoughts and witnessing our body. So there's many different benefits to practicing yoga. The same goes for cardio and strength training, where engaging sympathetic and parasympathetic, depending upon what exercise that you're doing, um, it also gives you greater ability to become more adaptive in your sympathetic and parasympathetic responses um, when you get to know your body more and how we're putting it through purposeful stress. The final exercise is EFT tapping. EFT stands for Emotional Freedom Technique. Its roots are in traditional Chinese medicine and taken from Qigong, where what this is, is it looks at different meridian lines or energy points in the body that specifically relate to calming down our emotional brain and trying to get the prefrontal back online, more of our higher thinking self. And this is also a pretty quick technique uh, where the exercise leads you through different parts of the body associated with the limbic system. 
And you can choose to do any of these, all of these, maybe one of these. Uh, some days I might pursue this like a buffet where I want all of it. Maybe the next day I only want to do one exercise. So find out and experiment what is best for you. Um, limbic system retraining is essentially an experiment on yourself, finding out the story, becoming more aware of you, and then choosing different tools that feel safe and beneficial for your own brain and body. So my encouragement to you is to um, find a professional that can help you with this, whether that's going to a yoga studio, um, you're more than welcome to reach out to me as well. And be curious and compassionate on your journey. If you have any questions about what you have heard today in our conversation, you can reach out to me at info at mindfulprof.com. My website's also linked below. And again, take all this information nice and slow. Take rest when you need and continue to instill compassion as the glue that can really hold all of this work together. <laughs>